very happy to have with us Jimena Riveros, Alvarez, Sofia, Jimena, Sofia Riveros Alvarez with us, who's been here also a panelist of our high level uh, conference on autonomous weapon systems. And I snatched her to be with us to talk about AI and my name is Talia Heinrich, and I am the Tech Diplomacy Focal Point in the Austrian Foreign Ministry. Maybe just a couple of words why we uh, also deal with technologies, uh, and then I will introduce uh, Jimena, and uh, we will also do a, a quick round of introductions, um, and I'll explain a bit for uh, the, the um, housekeeping rules for, for people who are sort of online, and then we start. So, why is the Austrian Foreign Ministry doing technology. I think the Autonomous Weapons Systems uh, Conference has shown the importance of technologies for all uh, fields of uh, US life. And as diplomats will certainly know, it has become a quite decisive factor of international relations and certainly the peace and security. And that's why we're interested. We're trying to boost our capacities, and that's also one of the reasons why we do these tech diplomacy talks. This time, the tech diplomacy is the uh, uh, side chat. So, um, what we're going to be doing is we have one uh, hour 30. It may now we'll frame the issue, explain a bit what is out there in terms of the applications in the law enforcement field. We'll explain also the challenges and the human rights standards and a bit forward looking. But Jimena is also interested in your views. So, we really want to uh, be as interactive as possible. So, at the end of uh, Jimena's talk, Please do raise your hand uh, and ask questions, fire away with the ideas you have. This is also part a bit of um, a, a global discussion that we all have on AI, particularly because Kimena is a member of the High Level Advisory Board on AI that was established by UN Secretary General Guterres, also to feed into the current debates on AI global governance and the global digital compact that is incidentally going to be negotiated first day really tomorrow in the So, uh, maybe just some ho uh, um, uh, housekeeping rules for those online. Please have your uh, mics muted. When we come to the interactive Q&A, please uh, raise your hand. You can also pose any questions in the chat. We will read them out later on. Uh, and yeah, let's all be happy and safe and light and friendly, and then I think this will be wonderful night of minutes. So, now I take great pleasure in introducing Jimena. Jimena is uh, an extremely well-renowned uh, international lawyer in the field of AI. As I already said, she's a member of the High Level Advisory Board uh, uh, on AI, but she also is a, uh, a Chief of Staff and Head Legal Advisor to Justice Dr. Loretta Ortiz out at the Mexican Supreme Court. Uh, but not only that, um, Jimena is a real uh, expert uh, in the field of autonomous weapon systems. That's why she's uh, raised uh, us to her participation at the Conference on Autonomous Weapon Systems. But she's also a commissioner of the Global Commission on Responsible and Official Intelligence in the Military Domain. You wrote several really interesting books, and we can talk about this later, but I think bottom line, we've got one of the finest lawyers and decision makers also in the, in the, on the question of the actual governance with us, and I'm very happy that you have found time with this issue. So with that, before you start, it was your wish that we do a quick introduction, so we as a community can also know each other the best. So in order to make it not too dull, May I suggest that I just say, you know, I start with A, whoever has the, you know, his first name starts with A, jumps up and does a quick introduction, name, and what organization. So let's try that. A. Who's, yes. Just get up. Andreas. <laughs> I'm the founder of an AI, uh, AI consulting company, Vantage AI. Uh, and before that, I used to work in uh, several policy fields in European, national, and international. Um, that was good. wonderful. I'm not sure if uh, well, if our participants, on this. yeah, but yeah. participants online. Uh, yeah, I think you've got the uh, any passes from the yes, okay. Just quickly, 
So, do you want me to do it again? Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> My name is uh, Andreas Lederer. I'm the founder of an AI consulting company uh, and, uh, for the last four years. And before that, he was working in uh, national uh, and international policy fields. So, thank you. My name is Peter Lueck. I'm from the Ministry of uh, Interior in, in Austria, from the Directorate of Law. And our uh, special interests, of course, in law enforcement uh, law and also in uh, the impact on democracy of AI yeah, is one of our topics. Thank you. Indeed, and you're also expert in the Council of Europe from the specialized commission on, that yes. works on AI and democracy. Yes, I, I mean. was yes, I was member in uh, Kahai and, and and now in, in, in Kai uh, working on, on the convention of the Council of Europe. The Convention on Artificial Intelligence. Well, it's daily. Mexico was also um, an observer. So, where are we now? A, B, B, A, B, B's? Hello, my name is Bernhard Schneider. I work at the Federal Bureau of Anti-Corruption uh, at the Department of Prevention, Education and International Work. We have C. Yes, Oh, not a B. So sorry. It's A and B, Alexander Bogdanovich, it's very nice oh. to meet you all. <laughs> I'm here on behalf of the United Nations Office for Project Services and very much looking forward to meeting you all into this time. Thank you. Thank you. No bees? We didn't skip it. But now we've got a C. Thank you very much. Christina Hardy, Federal Ministry of Labor and Economy. I had a few of the legal unit and my unit is Inter area responsible for human rights coordination. Thank you so much. And we have D, E, F, <laughs> Mr. F. Hello, I'm uh, Fahad Mouriki from the uh, DCC Parliament Session, and I'm uh, responsible of uh, the ONODC uh, meetings. So, so thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for being with us. So, F, G, H, G. Mr. G. Peter Schäfbeck, I'm working for the Austrian Parliamentary Administration. So you may ask, uh, uh, what's the interest of Parliament in, in AI? Well, on the one hand, it's a, it's a challenge to legislation. On the other hand, it might be uh, a useful tool to support legislation. We have done several projects in the field. Uh, so the most recent project was about using large language models for uh, making easier access to um, laws in a trans-jurisdictional and translingual perspective. Thank you so very much for being here. So G H I I. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ivan Akin from my consul from the, the Russian mission to the OSC, and I'm covering all the aspects of security and including transnational threats. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And we have another E. Oh, I, sorry. Uh, my name is Isabella Kiss. I'm from the Ministry of the Interior and I'm working in the legal field and therefore I'm very much interested in the legal aspects of AI. Thank you so much for being with us. And then we have another. Sí, I'm Ignacio Bailina Ruiz from the Permanent Mission of Spain, dealing with matters of the UNODC, which is the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Thank you so much Thank you for being with us. Where are we? I, J. Jay. Hello, my name is Julia. I'm currently working for the Fort Asset Ministry of Finance in the sector of telecommunications. And I'm a tourist and very much interested in human rights and digit as digital rights and the definition of this. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Which so J K L K. We've got a couple of Ks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katja Katzak. I'm from the Federal of Chancellery, and um, I'm also part of the unit for digitalization. Yeah. Hello, my name is Robert Kerensky. I'm from the Austrian MOI, and I'm a senior investigator at the Bureau of Anti Corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, K L M L. Yeah, good day, everybody. I'm Lysander Framework, Professor 
of Human and Fundamental Rights at the University of Vienna and uh, Scientific Director of the corresponding British Boswell Institute. Looking forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you so much for being here. So, LM. Good afternoon, Marion. I'm the head of office of the country office in Austria for the International Organization for Migration or UN Prevention. Excellent. You already said, you know, we discussed so little about AI and border control and migration. Hi, Brad Mahidi, so Dublin. Uh, I'm one of the few colleagues from our house here from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I am the deputy head of the uh, Human Rights Directorate, and I work a lot on UN issues related to human rights and all, all things digital, including the global digital conflict. So very much looking forward to uh, to the next week. N N N N Norbert Nora N O P uh, uh, hello, my name is Paul Fasching. I work for the Austrian Federal Ministry of the Interior. I work in the field of research and innovation for the ministry. Excellent. Thank you so much. Philip, so, now it's your turn. So, it's a wrong, wrong P, it's a, a Philip. Okay. So, my name is Philip Weinisch. I am the founder of SIGCODE 4.0. It's a connectivity platform, and I'm one of your uh, elite here, which we technicians, so I'm an engineer. And uh, our dialogue platform facilitates the exchange between technology experts, uh, diplomats, and social scientists. Thank you. R. You are S. Yes, wonderful. My name is uh, Salman Al Habish. I am from Yemen. I work in Yemen MPC here and uh, presented to the United Nations. And I have undertaken your Moody's. Thank you so much. And we have a few. No, Samantha. Hello, everybody. My name is Samantha Franco. I'm from the Permanent Mission of Mexico, dealing with UNODC matters. Thank you so much. So, if I think we're coming now to the end. T. Thank you. My name is Tanya Walter. I'm with the Department of Christina Hato in the Ministry for Economy and Trade. Okay. Thanks for coming. S T U Z U V V. My daughter Sarah, and uh, I'm also a government representative of Lithuania to UN and all international organizations. So I am, I, I'm sure that emerging technologies, scientific artificial intelligence, will not only dominate soon agendas of the international organizations, but it will shape our work and, and everything when we mean so therefore my interest to be uh, not behind. Indeed. Wonderful. Thank you for being with us. So, uh, VW. No. Oh, Q. Well, good afternoon. My name is Wendy O'Brien. I work at UNDC. I work on human rights and technology and also on human rights based leasing. So, this is right at the intersection of that. Um, and while I have the microphone equipped up that in two weeks um, during our crime commission, we'll have a couple of side events on human rights and technology and policing um, in case. Anyone is interested. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this information. So, W, X, uh, well, X, Y, <laughs> Yvonne. Ah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ye Monte. I'm from Bavina Mission of uh, Myanmar. And I'm dealing with uh, you know DC and Unido Medics. Um, I'm looking forward to the uh, presentation. Thank you. Very much. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, w well, Y Z. So all right. I think that's it. Wonderful. Thank you very much for all being with us. We're not gonna do the cover presentation of our online participants. I think we go right into the meta. I think our audience is really very much up. To, to, to the question at hand. You've just been at the conference. Shall we just maybe quickly, can you quickly give us some impression from the from the conference we just had at Wolfsburg and how this relates to our uh, 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 topic of today? What is what, what are we actually talking about? What are the challenges? 
And what are your suggestions for government solutions? I'm not sure if we have a solution, but how, how shall we go about this? <laughs> Great. So um, thank you, Claudia, and thank you uh, to the ministry and to all of you for, for being here. It's um, I'm glad to have had these introductions because I see a very diverse audience, which is great. Um, I think we can have a constructive dialogue, and I do want this to be interactive. I don't want to sit here and speak for an hour and a half. I want to hear from you what are your questions and uh, your concerns, because from all of your diverse perspectives, um, you know, it can also feed into what we're doing at the at the UN body, which is now um, the consultation. But we'll get to that. Um, so uh, to follow Claudia's uh, very nice agenda. So uh, yeah, we just had. I don't know if any of you were present at uh, the convention on autonomous weapons, or well, it's it's very interesting. It's the event of the year for everyone that's involved in uh, autonomous weapon systems. Um, so, so it's uh, we're very happy about everything that, uh, that that was discussed. There was a lot of perspectives and a lot of diversity. And uh, I don't know how well acquainted you are with this autonomous weapon system, which is not the topic of this conference. But just to give you a quick recap, um, and and. and the reason why it is similar and parallel to, to what we're going to be discussing today is at the end of the day, uh, the same weapons, they're not restricted to the military domain. Uh, some of the same autonomous weapons can be used or autonomous systems even. They can be equally used by civilians, so police, um, and even immigration authorities, which is even less discussed. So um, there's obviously a lot of reluctance from uh, states to regulate, including the military domain, um, but also in the civilian uh, application cases. So um, because of, you know, national security concerns and since, I mean, the military kind of involves a different set of rules, such as, you know, humanitarian law and uh, well, what is traditional, like international law conflicts that we're seeing today. Um, however, you know, policing is only regulated only, I mean, by uh, international human rights law. So that basically comes to each country's uh, jurisdictions. So there's less interest in other countries to kind of look at what other countries are doing or, you know, even kind of uh, disclose it. So that obviously leads to a lot of abuses. And when we're talking about uh, you know, these technologies which are novel and uh, quite ununderstood by the majority of uh, the population. Um, yes, it, it can it can lead to even more human rights abuses. So um, I had a little speech prepared, but I think it's just better if um, we kind of interact. So um, my main concern when it comes to to AI in law enforcement. Well, I actually call it the, the, the law and order cycle. So it starts with, uh, you know, the predictive policing and then uh, everything that happens after that when it enters uh, the kind of like the judicial uh, system until like, uh, you know, even when there are like a, a criminal uh, penitentiaries, administration, and even, you know, uh, determining who gets parole or not, like all of this predictiveness uh, based on algorithms and uh, data and synthetic data and all the biases that are kind of embedded within the systems that, you know, most people, even the users, do not even understand because there's lack of transparency, there's brittleness, there's, you know, misalignment. So, um, we, I don't know how well versed we all we all are in AI. So maybe we just so that I know where to start. So who's a show of hands? Uh, who's very familiar with AI? Who's more or less very familiar? Very familiar. Two, three, more or less familiar. One, two, three, four. Okay, less familiar. <laughs> The rest. Okay, okay, sorry, because then I just know where to start. Okay, so basically the problem with AI that uh, we're, we're seeing now is um, it's obviously fallible, you know, and that's the, I think that's one of the main problems that we have nowadays, that 
as a society, we're thinking of AI as this, you know, perfect solution for everything, whereas it's really not. As we can see, you know, with ChatGPT, uh, they're called hallucinations, you know, when it just makes stuff up. So if you, I don't know if you've tried to use ChatGPT. That's, have... that's the only AI I know. Yeah. That's the only AI? <laughs> okay. Well, um... I mean, for example, I tried to ask it, uh, you know, I don't know, tell me what are all the cases that talk about uh, labor law in the entire American Court of Justice, for example. And then just made cases up. So uh, th those are called hallucinations. And there's a lot of even uh, conflict with that term because um, a lot of people that are in this field uh, are very much against including myself, um, anthrop anthropomorphizing, it's a big word, the, uh, the technology. So that is kind of like describing it, uh, human-like um, understandings or characteristics. So, you know, when you talk about hallucinations, it's like referring to like what a human would do. Whereas it's basically just the failure of the system, right? That uh, it just malfunctions. So this is one problem. Because I think before this, um, and, and we saw this, for example, a judge in Colombia uh, used the uh, chat GPT to draft the uh, judgment. And, uh, you know, and it also made up case, like the precedent cases and stuff like that. So that was a big problem, you know. And that's why, you know, I, I call it the law and order cycle, uh, because it, it can be used in all of these different areas. And it obviously has different uh, human rights implications throughout. But um, anyway, so going back to the problems with AI. Um, so between the creation and uh, what actually happens, it's the, the, the neural networks, the processes by which AI kind of come up with an output, they're not directly uh, aligned or set out by the programmer. So it can come up with something completely different. And what happens in between is something that's called the black box. So, uh, for example, in the realm of autonomous weapons, and this is an example that I gave at my um, presentation there, um, you know, in humanitarian law, there is this principle that, uh, you know, you shall not cause unnecessary suffering upon a person. So if there is a, a system that sees a wounded person, uh, in the battlefield, uh, this would be a protected person normally, you know, under international humanitarian law. However, the system might just read the rule and uh, kill the person because, you know, do not, like a dead person doesn't suffer. So, I mean, it, it comes to this, like, to a conclusion, but obviously that's not what we mean by it, you know, and a human would understand that. But um, in the system, it's perfectly logical. And we do not know how they came to these conclusions. And it's been proven in different fields, all of these misalignments, they're called. So um, when you place these systems that are inherently unreliable, inherently unexplainable, inherently unpredictable, um, in contexts that actually have affectations uh, or on human rights, that is extremely delicate. Uh, you know, speaking about weapons, for example, like uh, it's the, the decision to take a human life. I mean, as a society, we need to ask ourselves, do we want to live in a world where a machine decides the value of a human being? You know, that is that is a problem. Or, and, and, but the same... Oh, wow. So the same thing happens uh, in law enforcement and in immigration because they they can also use force so that is that is a problem so deciding um those decisions are crucial and we're at the point in history which is on the scene before and it's unparalleled and it's a change of a paradigm where we're losing human volition from very very important decisions that have impact so this is a moment where all of the stakeholders, and I'm very happy to see that there's so much interest and so diverse interest, um, because we all need to participate in this debate. And uh, that is precisely why the Secretary General created uh, the advisory body that I'm a part of, 
um, because there are different uh, initiatives and all over the world and uh, in, like by region, by topic, by very many, even national ones, which are all very welcome and fantastic advances. But the problem is this, if, if we just proceed like this, we're just going to have fragmentation or just like a patchwork of initiatives as we've seen. Because, I mean, the European system is different than the American system or what the Chinese system, you know. So what that leads to is an unharmonious uh, legal framework. Um, and also that leads to forum shopping. So, you know, companies might just decide to just go to wherever, like tech paradises, uh, where they just can have a laxer uh, regulation. And that's obviously a problem. So that's why we need global governance that is applicable to everyone everywhere. Um, so the body is called, uh, so, so the slogan would be regulating or governing AI for humanity, for all of humanity, so equally. Um, the body, of course, looks at every single aspect of AI, like in broader principles of governance. So we're like looking at things up here. So we, um, issued our report in December. I don't know if you've read it, but um, I suggest you do. And uh, so we just delineate a couple of uh, principles, you know, that AI must be fair, transparent, all of these principles. Um, but we also set out red lines or the necessity to, to have these red lines. So what is acceptable and what is unacceptable uses of AI. And I think this is a core point of our report. And um, one that I'm very happy that's, that's there. Obviously, it's an interim report, so it was very short. We started in October, and then we produced this report by December. But by then, we had already somewhat of like over 40 meetings. So we were like very intensely working. And even coming up with this draft, it was like, I think, over 200 comments. And it was just a lot of uh, interactions within our group because we all, we're 38 in total and we come from like different backgrounds and from all over the world. So, um, so, so as you can see, we all have different priorities. For example, for me, the priority is uh, peace and security. Um, but now what we're doing towards our final report, which we will be um, issuing by June, hopefully, uh, so before the summit of the future, is uh, the consultation phase. So uh, each member might have one or two or no engagements. So I have six. <laughs> um, so I, it's peace and security, it's women, uh, the inclusion of women in um, Latin America, um, environment, standards, and children. So, um, but obviously there are so many more and more topics like finance or agriculture, health, so on. So all of these topics need to be covered, but you know, with global governance. So we cannot just we cannot go into like the nitty gritty of all of it, but we need to set the pace and set the tone and those red lines so that then we can build on specific regulation um, on each one of these different topics. So um that's what we're doing, and uh, it's feeding into the summit of the future directly to the secretary general and then on to states. So um, these red lines, and coming back to our topic, when we talk about uh, human rights violations, law enforcement, national security, I cannot tell you how much resistance <laughs> um, you know we've uh, encountered uh on well you know this is our issue like this is how we deal with our national security like the word national security is always you know just like a blocker of any conversation so um it's it's very complicated and it's there's a lot of if if ai is not transparent there's even less transparency on how some countries uh are dealing with their national uh, law enforcement and immigration authorities. And I really want to emphasize the uh, immigration because I think right now, you know, we're living in a crisis, like humanitarian crisis, and uh, this AI, the bias, you know, like uh, the surveillance and all of these human rights violations are just exacerbating everything that we are already experiencing as a society. So, I mean, 
as a lawyer, and I said this yesterday in my panel, it's pretty painful to live in a world where, you know, hum international law is completely uh, disobeyed. So we're just basically needing to rebuild trust in our legal order. And uh, because human rights are painfully at stake, um, that's, that's the problem. Human lives are at risk. And we're not really taking it seriously. So we've seen this in many contexts. Uh, so, and obviously from country to country, it's going to differ significantly how they conduct uh, internal or external operations, let's say. Um, so if you want to hear about specific use cases, I don't know if that was your expectation here, but it really depends on what type of country you're you're talking about and the practices that uh, they have. Um, at the core of it, um, we need to look at the values and the and the ethics of whichever agency you're talking about and all of that and how AI must align with them. So I'm not going to talk about specific cases, use cases. I can give you examples of, for example, how it can be exacerbated or not, if you want. But um, at this point, I think I would be more interested in hearing what you're interested in or, you know, so that we make it a circular kind of discussion, having had this uh, little primer. And if you have seen some examples yourself that you want to share or point out or even ask, you know, I'm just uh, on making a circular discussion. So the floor is yours. Please. Please go ahead. Mr. P, right? <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. I really enjoyed your um, iterations. Um, you you touched one topic that uh, I would like to ask you to elaborate a little more, and that is uh, the topic of bias and training data and uh, training bias. Um, because uh, not all countries have all data available, and if you use data from one country to apply it to and um, even a different jurisdiction, I would expect to be different results. Um, can you elaborate how you try to tackle this different data availability, data structures, and, and, and the overarching challenge of bias in, in, in training data? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, AI is based on data. There is no AI without data, right? So, um, bias is the biggest problem in it because we're talking about, I mean, the developing countries or the companies that are developing AI, they're, you know, you can count them with the with one hand. And uh, these are global north uh, countries. So obviously, for example, it's been proven that facial recognition works best on white males because those are the developers, the programmers and everything. So, you know, uh, my phone, I mean, your phone might recognize you better than mine. <laughs> So from those type of things. So if you're, I mean, when you talk about, you know, uh, police and, uh, or law enforcement kind of systems. So for example, the built-in cameras that uh, some countries are enforcing and having, I mean, they're supposed to like rebuild trust on uh, the, you know, to, to avoid abuses that of police or whatever. But if you put AI into that for like live facial recognition, then that's obviously a violation of privacy and everything. And if they're going to uh, do arrests based on that, you know, the program is or, it's already biased because if it looks at historical data, which it, that's how it works, um, then it might just have, for example, in the States, there was a, a man of color that was arrested and uh, just based on that, uh, or under on this predictive policing. And uh, they're doing a lawsuit and a very, you know, rightful lawsuit for this because he was just uh, shopping, <laughs> you know? But um, then and this just replicates this pattern. Um, even, for example, uh, this is even not for them, but, you know, bank loans, if you want to think about it, you know, they're mostly given uh, to white males and they're excluding even women altogether because historically women have not been asking for loans you know so then they're not given loans just because there's no record 
of them doing so, you know? And then if you, so, so, so that's the main problem, you know? So it's not even inherent bias that, you know, kind of uh, transmitted from the programmer to the system, but it's just historical information. Another big example is um, the lack of information of the global south, you know, because a lot of it, even the language, you know, because the, the, their programmers are programming in English. So there are a lot of uh, languages that are completely left out and uh, a country, um, for example, India, you know, a lot of it, their tradition is even not uh, written. So all of that is excluded. And that's like a massive amount of millions of people that are just completely uh, forgotten from the data system that is available. So obviously there are going to be a lot of biases and they're replicating these patterns. And obviously that leads to human rights violations just being accentuated and accentuated by the use of them. So if you... Uh, if you transpose that onto someone that can use force, such as, you know, uh, law enforcement, or someone that can decide upon, uh, like, um, sentencing, for example, or judgments, like, or even the probability of someone committing a crime, or someone that has been sentenced and recommitting a crime, uh, just based on what is literally just, uh, you know, racial social profiling exponentiated by a machine you know and then we the problem again you know the the confirmation bias humans trust are you know overly misleadingly trusting the system because we think that it's better than us because it can absorb more information because it can learn faster because it self-learns because it's whatever but at the same time it's just doing all of these things so then even when the program presents it to you and says, oh, it's 90% or even 99% uh, probable that it's accurate, you're just going to find out, is it yes, it's surely going to be that without even checking. So not only, you know, talking about how the analytical functions of humans might just, you know, disappear. Um, this is clearly a problem uh, because once you're checking, it's already too late. You know, the problem is preventing that. And that's why we need to do global governance. And that includes, uh, obviously, data governance as well. So that is a big part of the digital compact as well. So, good question. Thank you very much. I, the, the gentleman in the back, um, you, I forgot your... It's an L. It's an L, yeah. Well, many, many thanks for your, for your introduction. Um, I, I fully understand there's public international and your concerns relating to fragmentation. And I think we all agree that we have a strong need in international relation. But I, I wonder how to, to overcome the concerns and the controversies. To give, to give one example, the EU recently agreed upon an AI Act, somehow banning out um, a social credit system as it is very present in, in an important country in the Far East and the backbone of its authority. Um, so I would assume that there is, is little consensus on, on banning or ruling out social credit systems. So what is the core? What is the core we can we can agree upon as, as necessary on, it, on the international level? Isn't it, doesn't it make sense to have these regional approaches? Something we also see in human rights law, because these days, I'm afraid, we would not find sufficient consensus in the General Assembly for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So what can be the outcome of, of your work and what can be, what can be the, the minimum we can agree upon? And if I may ask a second question, um, we often talk about human in the loop or human on the loop. And I would fully agree. But more, for me, it's more about empathy, having, having some, somebody involved who knows what it means to be a human being, besides the question of the courtesy. But I have the impression that not even these considerations about a human being beings involved is, is sufficiently supported by international consensus. 
isn't it comparable to nuclear weapons? States having nuclear weapons will never concede. Um, so states that have a strong interest in some technology in AI are not very likely to agree to limitations. This is the backbone of them. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much. Shall we take several or shall we, shall we go one after of the one? We have a couple of others. Maybe well, that was a quite compound question. So if I take more, I will forget some points. Yes, that's true. That's so, that's um, yes, the first one on the, on the regional government system, because it will be so hard to yes. come up well, with global governments. Consensus is hard anyway. Um, for a variety of topics now, it seems like the world is just not agreeing on anything at the moment. And uh, that, I don't know if that's the cause or the result of this eroding legal system that we're having at the moment, but it's obviously not the best way to go. So um, the fact that the system is not working doesn't mean that we stop trying. And when it comes to AI, you know, it is like it's transboundary. Like it, it's you know, it's uh, it's we cannot even describe how it's just everywhere. You know, in in our daily lives, everywhere. So you cannot restrict it to jurisdictions. You cannot restrict it to a region or to a country. You know, it's everywhere. So in that sense, it needs to be regulated the same way for everyone wherever they are, because it cannot be different. Uh, depending on when you're standing. I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, even if your computer you can just change your VPN and then you can just be wherever in the world. You don't even have to physically move. So uh, that's why it is vital to, to build upon this consensus. And I think we're have, we have this building momentum now coming with the summit of the future. And that's the whole point of the digital compact and everything that's happening there. It's to come up together because we're facing a new, a new monster, so to speak, you know, something that we've never seen before. And if we don't pull up together in a, in a different way, then this technology is just going to consume us. And that, and I don't mean that in a good way. Like it's, it's like it, AI has a great, fantastic potential to do great things for humanity. But it also has a very dangerous potential, catastrophic even. So that's why we need to we need to decide how we are going to regulate it, how we're going to interact with the technology before it's you know too late to even decide. And on your other point about empathy and like humans in the loop or of the loop, or that's meaningful human control, and that's being like widely discussed, for example, next door at the at the at the convention, and it does draw parallels on the nuclear and also on the chemical and biological risks, you know, and weapons and all of this, uh, and and we're harnessing from all of the existing um, legal frameworks and trying to see, you know, parallels and what can fit and what could not. But the thing is, with AI, there's no uh, exact equivalent that could be applicable because it's just so different because the lack of human volition changes it all. It's a really, it's a game changer. So you talk about empathy. Well, yes, I mean, we have to decide now, you know, and uh, think about it and ask these questions. Like, how do we want to interact with this technology? And uh, what, what powers and what uh, decisions? Do we want to grant it? Because at the end of the day, the difference, for example, with nuclear, which what you're talking about is AI is much, much more scalable. You know, uh, it's readily available for everyone. And that's also a problem, for example, even for, you know, uh, law enforcement or national security, because the same technology is can, that can be used by the military, by law enforcement, is also going to be used by other malicious actors like, you know, terrorists, organized crime you know, or just some person in, like, it doesn't have to be big scale, but it, like, just a small one can do a lot of harm. However, like, hacking in cybersecurity, like, all of these things, you know, and we've all seen this. So can you just uh, see that being AI enhanced? And that doesn't necessarily, and it's so much cheaper, and it's easily detected, and, you know, nuclear powers, like, I mean, you can detect a nuclear plant, like, you need specific set of 
you know, materials and everything and circumstances, and it's detectable. Whereas, you know, you can just be someone in somewhere in, in a basement somewhere, and you know, that's completely undetectable. And the anonymity behind all of this makes it very difficult. And precisely why, you know, we have to have the same rules applicable everywhere, because otherwise we're gonna have this anonymous person somewhere else creating damage in another place. And the remoteness of that is is a problem. Did I miss any of these questions? I do feel sufficiently responded. <laughs> if I may add, just to also in response to what I said, first of all, just to let you know, so we have a consensus on banning social security. 192 countries, uh, 193 countries in UNESCO uh, adopted the UNESCO uh, recommendation on ethics of the eye, whereas explicitly social scoring was, was, was mentioned as, as, as something that was unacceptable. And finally, the Chinese even uh, uh, this, you know, I think the country you mentioned uh, uh, accepted it too. Uh, they somehow missed out. Didn't they? Um, I missed that point. And secondly, the point you made, sorry, uh, that you know those who develop it will never uh, concede to limitations. I think on the conference we had a couple of examples where you show that, like the landmines were mentioned, you know, even though some countries, big producers and users of landmines, have not ratified the landmines treaty it still changed behavior. And I give you a second example. I know that very well because I was a, a young law student at the time. Uh, US battled fiercely against uh, uh, the establishment of an international criminal court, precisely because they didn't want to you know, have international uh, criminal jurisdiction upon US nationals. But it did, did change behavior in a, in a way too. It changes behavior. So I think we have to start. Uh, in particular, when it comes to, you know, really hardcore questions of, uh, of 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 where human dignity is at stake, and that's certainly you know the question that we're debating the autonomous weapons system. So I stop here because it's not me who is the guest of honor. I saw um, Murat who wanted to say something, and then then the gentleman from the parliament, and let's also check whether we have online. Thank you very much. So many questions. Thanks so much already for all the input. I'll try to uh, to to speak myself to two questions. Uh, when we discuss about uh, human rights effects of uh, AI uses, we very quickly end up with a discussion around uh, bias and algorithmic bias and uh, and problems linked to that. But one one of the questions that I always have, and that I would like to get, uh, direct at you, that the reason why we have problems with with biases is not inherent to AI, it's because the uh, bias is in the data. The reason it's in the data is because it comes from people. So it's just a reflection of biases that are already out there. And if you if, if you look a certain way and you travel and you regularly get randomly selected at airports for, for security checks, you know that the biases are out there in the real world, uh, no, no, no matter uh, if, if there's AI in use or not. So I wonder if you can also flip the question around, can AI especially in the, in, in, in the area of law enforcement, be used to address the problem of biases being out there? Can AI be, be because we, we, we very often talk about the positive uses of artificial intelligence, how can we use AI in, in a positive uh, way to improve the situation in law enforcement? <clears throat> and the second question linked to law enforcement, because it's such a sensitive issue, I, is how do you see the question of accountability when we use AI in law enforcement setting, uh, settings, where does accountability lie? Because we, you mentioned the black box that the decision-making processes often are, is the accountability, I mean, ultimately it's going to be with the state, but uh, how, what, what role do the companies that, uh, that, that, that produce the AI systems in, in, in making sure there is accountability for human rights violations? Thanks. Thank you. Well, I think we discussed the bias um, problem already. And uh, I don't think AI can correct the bias. I, as I said, I think it's just going to exacerbate it. And it's historical bias, like replication of just like the existing data that it has. And it's also the, the, the bias that are transmitted onto the system. So it's both. And it's also, you know, and then when you come with synthetic data, you know, like a machine learning and deeper, and then it's just like, you know, it's exponentiated. So it doubles and triples and so on. So um, I don't think that would be one of the positive outcomes. It's rather kind of the opposite. But um, 
the second question, um, which was, can you remind me? Accountability. Accountability, yes. So accountability, you need to think about, so which case are you talking about? Like when it's a weapon or, for example, because... AI, in general, the accountability problem, uh, and we often forget the multiplicity of actors that are involved. Um, so I, it is, I call it the atomization, atomization of accountability because we have the developers, which are often not only just one person or one company, there are different companies uh, working together at different stages. And then uh, it comes to whoever has purchased the system and everyone in between that even trains the people that are using them or the, we, we, call, we call them the AI integrators. So within the application or the environment that they're going to be used. And then um, who actually is deploying it or using it in a specific way. And then, uh, you know, whoever is, has authorized that even before it. And if, when we're talking, for example, about weapons, it's even like the cycle goes on until their disposal. So uh, each one of these have a different type of responsibility, obviously, you know, uh, depending on the, the various modes of responsibility. And the, in the majority of, or if not all, of the different legal systems, <laughs> To a, in order to ascribe responsibility to someone, they're going to be the nexus. And when you're talking about criminal responsibility, intent, in some cases, even specific intent. So that, that is missing, you know, when you, when you lose the human volition in the middle, you know, because even if these are unintended results that happen with these misalignments, you know, I argue that, you know, people, there still should be accountability because you're deploying something that's unpredictable. So it's already foreseeable that everything that could go wrong might go wrong. So and you're 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 already accepting that risk. And there's responsibility in that, in my opinion. Um, obviously, there are a lot of people that are of the opposite view, like, no, no, this is them, you know, I had nothing to do with it. And it's the easy way out, you know, and then you know. Who then do you trace trace it back? It's it, it is untraceable, so it is a big problem accountability. And uh, for example, when you it's, when you talk about say the use of force, if you use it uh, unlawfully, for example with these uh, body cams, imagine that a policeman uh, tries to arrest someone and then there is some resistance and then the person gets injured or even killed. And then the policeman's going to be like, well, but you know, the system told me that this was the person. And then what? You know, and then it's based on bias data, you know. I know that happens already. Like, that is just a human, human bias. But the problem is, then at least you have the human to hold accountable. You know, there is no missing link, as there would be now with AI. It's the perfect excuse, you know. So we must not allow. Uh, these agencies that have the power to use force to have that perfect excuse, you know? Because then governments, uh, in whatever category you want to place them, um, might might just have this as a very convenient uh, resource, you know? But for example, when you're also talking about the use of AI, say, because even, again, with the example of the body cam, Sometimes it's used as uh, like evidence retrieval, right? So like, but what if AI, you know, like misrepresents something, you know, or AI in a judgment, like for example, yes. this case, right? Like the Colombian judge that used, uh, like, what do you think should happen to that judge, you know? Um, or if... Or even more mundanely, you know, when uh, AI is being used for, say, in the court systems uh, to review data, to review cases and review this information, what if it misinterprets something and then transmits it and then the judgment is based upon something that's wrong? You know, it, it really has severe implications in our human lives and in our human rights that have this missing link. So for me, the accountability gap is a primordial issue that we must keep in mind. And that is why we must restrict the use of AI 
to the functions that do not have these implications, you know, to the functions that, that cannot transcend into the human rights realm. So that is, uh, that is complicated to achieve in practice because once, uh, once the system is out there, you know, it is uh, impregnated and it permeates everywhere. And, but um, that's, that's why global governance is so important in order to keep like this baseline and, uh, and the right lines of what's acceptable and what's not. Maybe one example of an AI that can be used to help with sort of countering human rights violations. Uh, just uh, found an Austrian startup that works on AI solutions to help to test simulating AI applications and testing them for uh, a fundamental rights impact assessment. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you have as a as a as a public authority, uh, uh, you want to buy you know whatever AI solution is in the market, and you're not quite sure which one would inform actually the need for a human rights impact assessment. We can use that AI <laughs> to check the other AI whether which one has a, has a better score in human rights and practices. So, next question, our colleague from the Parliament, and then uh, Ignacio. Right. Thank you. I was wondering how long it would take until the term bias would come up. Actually, it didn't take much time. Um, I would, I would uh, even stronger than Murad before. Uh, claim that bias is what makes machine human, machines human. Uh, human decisions are biased. And so if you are using case-based systems, their decisions will be biased too, very logically. So what can you do? On the one hand, you can build rule-based systems, which probably um, won't be as easy as uh, building case-based systems. Take much more investment and time and, and development effort. On the other hand, uh, you can, uh, if you want to still use uh, case-based systems, uh, you can use a supervised learning approach instead of an unsupervised learning approach. Um, actually, if you take the unsupervised learning approach, you will have the full bias. If you take a supervised learning approach, you can reduce the bias uh, by um, by telling the system to um, to give different weights to different cases. So there are ways, I would say, to handle uh, the bias uh, issue. Nonetheless, uh, still, um, I would say, and you mentioned before um, some other issues like the issue of, uh, of um, the stochastic um, uh, the probability. Um, you mentioned 99% um, is, um, is extremely high for decisions made by humans. Normally, decisions made by humans have, are based on uh, on um, perhaps 50% or 51% uh, probability to, to be the right decisions. So uh, I still would claim that uh, AI is not only the risk that, that nowadays, in particular in Europe, um, we are tending to, to see it. Um, AI is also a big chance to significantly increase uh, the amount of information uh, being taken into account when making decisions. But you still, of course, also uh, need a human being. Uh, finally, uh, some example from medicine. Uh, you know, medicine is one of the fields where AI has been uh, developed very early. For example, analyzing photographs of cancer features. And there has been a study which um, compared um, the, um, the result of human analysis of uh, cancer, uh, cancer photographs with the result of machine analysis of cancer photographs and the result of an analysis done by machines together with humans. So um, the results of the machine analysis were significantly better than the results of human analysis. But the best results were provided by machines working together with humans. So, Maybe that's for the near future of uh, the way to choose. You'd like to respond from this? Yes. Um, as I said, AI is a double edged sword. You know, um, it can help, but it can also harm. So, in the medical field, for example, um, and in any other field, I mean, I said 99% is like a number, 
But uh, obviously, depending on the use case, you know, it has different probabilities. For example, in the weapons area, like uh, the systems that are being used in Israel, they say they have 90% accuracy. But that 10% of like 40,000 people that have been killed, 40, 10% is even 4,000 people. Like that's a lot, you know? So that margin of error, when it translates into in the problem scalability, that is not acceptable. It is it is acceptable if my phone doesn't recognize me or if ChatGPT invents something, but it's not acceptable if AI uh, arrests you, even if it's a one percent chance that it might that it might arrest you by mistake. You know, because it confuses your face with someone else because you were wearing glasses that day or you weren't wearing glasses that day or whatever variable it that that, that it changes their data. So. Yes, of course. There are a lot of ways in which uh, AI can enhance and, you know, ameliorate our society. Um, but even, like, in the global sphere of things, like, it has even been discussed, like, oh, let's have this giant AI supervisor of everything in AI, even, like, in the global governance. But it's, yeah, I think it, it's kind of like the poison is the cure type of situation where I wouldn't necessarily trust that. Um, I mean, it's an interesting approach, you know, but I think at this point, it's all just experimental. So it's not something we could rely on. And uh, especially, and going back to the medical, I can't remember now the name, uh, but this system uh, of predicting um, diseases, I have a friend that uh, was told, you know, a 90% chance you have breast cancer. So she immediately, you know, went and had the surgery and got them taken out. And it wasn't even necessary because it turns out that we got the biopsy and it wasn't the case. The system just detected an anomaly, you know. So and you might say, OK, this is just one person, but it is a person's life, you know, and it does have implication. Um, so machines are machines and humans are humans. So machines aren't human just because they have biases. <laughs> um, so and and again, you know, we come, when we come back to uh, this um, anthropomorphization of the technology, and I hear it a lot amongst um, like the, the the industry, the developers. You know, they say, "Oh, let's think of AI not as a tool, but as a coworker, as a as a partner, as a companion," and that is terrifying to me. I mean, maybe I'm just more risk averse, being a lawyer and everything, and Fun fact, within the body, uh, the advisory body, so we had three working groups. So one was uh, opportunities and enablers, one was risks and challenges, and the other one was for governance. So all the uh, members of the um, uh, opportunities and enablers were men, and all of the people in risks and challenges were women. <laughs> so that's just, um, and, and also, those uh, the, the members and the opportunities and enablers were from the industry, so you know, makes sense. Whereas uh, the recent giant rumors, but it was an interesting uh, situation. But um, but yeah, so I I think even a one percent chance, whereas it's it's a larger percentage of fallibility. But I think when human lives are at stake, even it, that one percent, it's unacceptable. And even if a human would still have that margin of error or even a larger margin of error. But then that's when we come to like human dignity and all of these questions, you know, and accountability, right or wrong. Because then you can still hold the human accountable for that error. And, you know, with the, there's this social understanding of humans uh, interacting and responding to. Whereas, you know, when you have something else, something that's inanimate, deciding and affecting, your 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 human situation, in my opinion, that is something. But it's obviously a current debate. So it's actually also the point that was made before the empathy question. As you say, we, we discussed this also in the autonomous weapon system that it is just also, you know, a, a inherently ethical, inhumane situation to have a machine deciding on death and death and life. I think there are cases also in law enforcement, you know, with the sentencing and all the rest. It's just, I think that as a human, you have the right 
to be judged by your peer and not by a machine. I mean, that's, the, that, that's something that really goes to human dignity before it can end. Um, I have a question here from sorry. the lady from you. Uh, ah, Ignacio, sorry. Ignacio. You don't mind. <laughs> Ignacio and then W. Thank you. Thank you very much. In, in the scenario you have depicted, the, the human volunty seems to be important. Do this uh, uh, global governance group speaks about it? There should be a possibility of having an agree on, on what would be a uh, human volunty introduced in AI. Thank you. Human volunty? Volition? Yeah, the, the human factor that would uh, alleviate all the... Ah, the meaningful human control, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Well, the, the point is there's not even a definition on what meaningful human control is, um, because it really depends on even the scenario. So, and again, coming back from, for example, uh, the, the weapons example. So the problem is, you know, autonomy and the different levels of autonomy and how much human machine teaming there can be. Um, so how, how much control the person has, and that's where like all these terms of like human in the loop, human off the loop, human on the loop, all these things. But the problem is, even when you have systems that are not entirely um, or not fully autonomous, for example, a swarm of drones. So if you're controlling, uh, if there's one human operator that's fully in control and can stop it at any time, you know, each one of these, but you know, is, is controlling what 500 drones are doing at the same time, then is that really human control or is that just a simulation of it? You know, because it's just practically impossible to control all of this at the same time. So um, that could be one example of where autonomy, full autonomy is not necessarily uh, linked to human, to the loss of human control, even when there is a human in the loop. But most of the time, uh, the, the thing is, how much is it uh, that the interaction is happening? Because the operator might not even understand fully the system or its capabilities, you know? So there might be unintended circumstances that even if the person is completely there, you know, if it's just one system. You know, but if, it, if, if, the, if the operator doesn't completely really understand it, which normally is the case, unfortunately, for example, with law enforcement or I can tell from the judiciary, you know, if you don't understand, then errors are easily going to be undetected. And then the machine is going to learn that the error is fine and then it's going to replicate itself. So that leads to a whole different set of problems. So the, in... Concrete terms, there is no uh, definition for what meaningful uh, human control is because it's not a one-size-fits-all situation because for each use case, it's going to look differently what human control would be. And that's the problem, you see? The lady, I think your name, I know it's W, but... Wendy. Wendy, absolutely. Wendy, please, don't you know the scene. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really enjoying listening to your remarks. Thank you. And to all the really great questions that people have asked. Uh, and I wanted to ask a question around strategy for governance. And I appreciate very much this question that was asked around, uh, you know, international strategy. How can we you know, come to consensus internationally? Um, I don't want to pick that up again because I think we can't talk about too many complex things at once. I wanted to maybe ask a question around sector specific strategy. Mm -hmm. So specifically with uh, regards to law enforcement policing, um, there is there are a number of problems. I think. We want to sit for a moment on risks that we assess risk um, and, and look at how we can mitigate that risk. I think there are some things that are stacked against us. One is that when we talk about AI, we talk about it in the future tense. AI hey, can do this, AI hey, will do that. We have had it operating in law enforcement for decades and we have documented um, so I think that this is something that we need to come to grips with. 
Um, I also think that uh, in terms of, you know, confirmation bias, computational bias, which you um, mentioned as well, um, mapped onto the current state of things, which is, you know, there's a lot of people on the move, there's a lot of crime, there's a lot of uncertainty, just had a pandemic, um, there's geopolitical tensions, you know, we're not in the best shape at the moment, and so technological determinism is finding really fertile ground. Um, so I think there's there's quite a lot of ways in which uh, it's very difficult for human rights lawyers to come along and say human dignity, and I appreciate very much that you've said so many times human dignity. I fully agree. So my question then is, given that we have had for a number of years the uh, commission on the High Commissioner on Human Rights has said there should be a moratorium on the use of AI that can't be proven to be aligned with human rights, to see this reiterated again in the General Assembly resolution on AI, um, that it should be, we should cease using AI that is not consistent with human rights. Um, but we're not necessarily seeing that at the policy level, nationally, um, uh, in law enforcement. So the question is, how can we? What is it? What are the levers? Because you mentioned before national security. National security tends to shut down these kinds of conversations. It's Trump. It trumps it. It's a like a Trump um, it, it's seen as being a priority. Just to be clear, I'm talking about it as a priority card. Um, uh, and I think that, it, that we are in a moment where we have to recognise that that is important to states. Law enforcement and human rights are not mutually incompatible. I think that they are mutually complementary. And I think that my sense of the strategy we can take is to spend more time being very clever about how we can make the case that human rights are mutually constitutive of safe and secure societies. Um, and we need to do that in a very clever way um, that puts the right guardrails around AI. But I know that you will have thought about this. I know that it will have been discussed um, as well in the working group. Uh, so I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, that's the whole point of uh, having set out guiding principles in the report, you know. So what? how are we going to conduct um, basically the deployment and the uses of AI? So I encourage you to uh, to read our report. I'm not going to give you any spoilers. Well, I have already have a few, but please proceed to read it. Um, and also there's red lines. So as long as we stay within those lines uh, with the, and following the guiding principles, we shall be fine in whichever sector, you know, because we cannot have different rules applying to different sectors. They, you know, that's again, you know, kind of the regional question all over again. We do need to have like this global governance that applies for every sector, for every region, for every actor, you know, because even for, for actors, you know, so people say, oh, but it's different if it's like a state using it, or if it's a non-state actor using it, then the rule should be the same, you know? because the effects are the same. So um, that's why we cannot do like, I mean, then then after that, that's global governance. You know, that's, that's the stage we're at right now. And then obviously we come like down to all those different layers of regulation, which is obviously, you know, you can go into more of the sectorial details. And uh, what we're talking about here is not, that AI is divorced from human rights. It's just the use of how you, you use AI and what you use it for, you know? And uh, for example, these decisions, you know, that's why we come back to like, let's, let's think about it as a society, how, what decisions we want to delegate to, to the systems and uh, what decisions do we want to retain because of human dignity, because of uh, different things, you know? Um, there's there's ethics, you know, there's morality, there's even religious considerations surrounding all of this, you know? So um, when we're talking about the law and order of a society and the use of AI, it could be uh, a good thing, as in many of the other areas. The problem is we need to be very careful and very transparent on how and what we're using it for, you know? Because even if you say, oh, well, you know, uh, AI is, and you're totally right, it is being used, it's not can, it is. And, and the thing 
And the reason why everyone still says can is because of the lack of transparency. You know, because it has not been out in, in the in the public eye for 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 the majority of people. You know, if you don't ask or inquire, you know, you don't find out, and that's a big problem. You know, but that's that's the norm in national security. As you say. when you say it's a Trump card, as a it's also a name card. <laughs> so, um, and we're going to see more of that, probably. Um, but yeah, so the, the point is we need to, in every sector, just abide by the same principles. So we have been thinking about it in this sense. Do we have any questions from uh, online participants? We do have a comment on a previous question. Um, um, you know, can you bring um, yeah. it? The mic to Martin, please. Thanks. So this uh, comment comes from Rania Wasir. She's from the uh, Austrian, well, startup at this based in Vienna, as far as I know, Leibant.ai. Um, she commented on the opportunities this, that AI uh, might bring, and I will just read it out. Uh, she says, more recent studies have shown that working with AI systems improves the work of inexperienced phys physicians, but that of experts to a much lesser extent. In addition, if the AI system is faulty, it decreases the performance of the humans across the board. So we need to learn how to work with the AI systems and need ways to ensure that they are functional in order to ensure that we benefit from them. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. I have a question on global governments. It's a frequently asked question today. Um, but still, I've been dealing with cybersecurity issues for a couple of years, focusing more on companies and companies building measures, uh, which regional ones. But following all sorts of discussions within the UN on the cyber threat, and uh, there have been like a decade of discussions with uh, numerous uh, governmental uh, groups of experts, uh, open and liberal group. So, a decade of discussions, and today we have a couple of reports we have a norms of responsible state behavior and some political commitments with no um, global accord or convention or whatever. So, do you take into account that experience? Because cybersecurity I and mean, cyber ICT is also well used technology. And uh, there are some, to me, at least I'm not an expert in AI, but I see some similarities here. And I see that uh, 12, even 15 years of discussions led to, well, to nowhere, at this stage at least. So, do you have other approach and do you uh, 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 use some best practices for what you can know in the UN on the cyber security issues? Thank you. Well, yeah, uh, we have been obviously uh, cyber is very relatable, um, and there are many, many different uh, even autonomous weapons. You know, it's been stagnated for like fifteen years. The discussions, also in the UN, CCW. So uh, the thing is, these have been separate attempts, and the thing with AI and the difference with cyber. Is I mean AI enhances cyber, you know, it, uh, and and it is in the scalability of it and the unpredictability of it and the momentum that we're all seeing, you know, it's kind of like crashing upon us uh, AI in general, you know, from with the rise of ChatGPT and whatever. So um, I, that's why I think this is different because we have the momentum that is building from you know society understanding that we really are at a point of transformation, societal transformation. Like we have never in not even our generation or so many generations before us have seen something so transformative, you know, not even with the industrial revolution, something so transformative happened. So this is the brain. So I don't think we understood that as a society with cyber and that's a failure. But I think we learned from that experience and that's where we remain hopeful. And that's why we encourage all of you actors, you know, uh, to to step up and help us, you know, continue building that consensus. <laughs> because if we don't do this, we are kind of aware of what what the risks are. Let's say. 
if I may add, I also think that if you look back, uh, you know, when we started discussing digital issues in the international field, the, the World Summit of the Malaysia Society in 2003, 2005, and then, you know, and then you have the platforms, I found the only, or Mr. Bobo found that they changed a lot. And it took so, quite some time, and it took so, quite some scandals to, to make people aware. And you're totally right, um, within, you know, Chechi became out in some, some, someone in autumn 22. And then I think we've never seen so quick a response globally, you know, with so many initiatives springing up, so many uh, different um, uh, uh, governments, uh, processes that come up, and a real urgency of the moment. And you see that particularly, um, I think, coming from all over, and certainly from majority of countries from the global south, who, you know, who increasingly seem to be fed up, you know, with a global now, global mode, producing technology um, that benefits only a few. We have a discussion of you know, the power asymmetries, who's actually developing using our products, and for what purpose. Uh, and I think there's a real movement also to understand that these power asymmetries are a, a danger to peace and security in itself, too. And I think the urgency is, is being captured, uh, at least in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the discussions by business. But again, it's not me who's discussing. Can I just add on to that very quickly? Yes, so it's very important because we touched upon the, the digital divide. And uh, that's something that's just going to be widened. That gap is just going to be widened now with the AI. And I can give you an example. At the Supreme Court in Mexico, we drafted a judgment um, where, because basically we're trying to recognize uh, the right to electric power because it's a, so it's a, it's a human right and the state is obliged to uh, guarantee it and all of this uh, because they wanted to, to privatize it. Um, so the part for the recognition of it, of, of it as a human right, we missed one vote. So that was very sad and me and my boss wrote a book about it, but the missed opportunity that, you know, we couldn't recognize this really big. But the, the rest of the judgment was but the problem is now, you know, we're talking about even then, you know, uh, 5G as a human right or AI, the access to it. How are you going to talk about any of this where there are countries where you cannot even have electricity, you know? And this is just going to continue. And it just doesn't, and it's, you know, physical infrastructure that the governments lack, you know, that uh, initiatives, even at the... Um, at the at the local level, you know, capacity lacking, understanding lacking, or even this simple access to electricity. So how are we going to do that? That is a big, big, big question. And that's what we're talking about a lot in the group. You know, how because this can bring great attention, but to whom? That's why we need this global governance. It's so 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 important. Because then we can bridge the gap. And that's why the UN is the right forum to do this, because we have equal participation from the global north and the global south. And if we go back to the weapons, for example, if it was the global south countries that were developing these weapons, then it would be a very different conversation. Because, you know, then if we were to develop them into the global north, there would be already a ban, you know? Whereas when it's the other way around, uh, the, the yeah, it's, it's complicated. However, now we're and this is also something why I think we will have a difference in the way that uh, the negotiations are happening, is that countries are also realizing that there's an important shift of balance and shift of power that's happening. Because, yes, some states develop it, but the, it's, it's the companies, actually, that, you know, might have even more power than the states. And, and the states are understanding that. And uh, that's also going to change how they will try to regulate this, I think. So we're, we're really facing a completely different beast than we've ever seen. So, so I really do encourage all of you to, to participate actively in this uh, consensus building moment. But please do a question. Yes, and that's a, yeah. please. Yeah, at the end, I, I'll try to, to bring a little bit provoke a question, which would <laughs> uh, make your sort of our conversation even more uh, sort of juicy. Uh, 
I believe, for example, in in global governance, and I, I you know, us as a country, should do a lot to to make it as effective as possible. But when I listen to you, and also I listen, you know, I read a lot of articles and books. You know, we have very scary present and even more scary future. We always will be lagging behind. It doesn't matter how much we will be ready to govern, we always will be lagging behind. So my pro not provocative question, but some kind of thinking, you know, instead of trying to always catch up what you will never catch up, never. So invest in education to employ AI for education and to make us humans, humankind, more advanced and not allow things happen, not to try to limit and restrict. I mean, you just uh, mentioned knowledge, double, double edged sword, you know, to make the, the bad side of it, negative side of it, not so sharp. So therefore, I, I'm, I'm really missing the investment politically, the economically, in education. Education, and then I think so. This partly solves the problem of of the digital divide, you know, because nowadays you can actually basically educate anyone anywhere, you know, if, if you have proper tools. So therefore, I, I I'm thinking, you know, how to feel happier, you know, and not so hopeless when when you know going after and trying to catch something what you will never catch. Instead of that, maybe it's better to invest in something what will make me better, you know, in this one who's going to run away from me will be slower. Well, um, I, if you mean education in general, like the cases that have been mentioned, you know, it's a highly educated people that, you know, still use AI and it's gone wrong, like judges, doctors, you know, so I don't think even the mostly educated people uh, can still use this technology and it can still be harm, even if it's on its end. So, um, but if you're talking about like education of AI or like, you know, people using AI, that's capacity building and that's, you know, something else. Education ourselves with AI together, that we together, I mean, it was very right analogy here that, which then uh, afterwards was uh, I a mean, question that, that, uh, Humans, especially together, you know, with AI, are better than just pure AI, but they are worse than than in, in assessing, evaluating, you know, cancer pictures than just humans. So I mean that having AI in the educational process basically makes us us better as humans, you know, just to in our evolution to just to jump out one one extra jump. You know, to make it simply better, you know, together. Yeah, that would be the best case scenario, and it hasn't. Why not go for the best case scenario? Then? Because it's it it's it's dual purpose. It's dual. It's a double edged sword. I mean, however you see it, it will still have the good side and the bad side. So the point of having these red lines is try to maintain it on the good side, uh, precisely because of everything you said. Because all of that is possible, but the problem is. We cannot ignore the other part because that that is very that that is very risky. However, uh, going back to the, I mean, everything in law, you know, law is always one or ten or twenty thousand steps behind reality. That's just a fact uh, because it comes exposed. But now we are at a moment where we really need to think of, and you know in terms of the actual wordings you know it obviously needs to be tech neutral and so on so that it doesn't just like apply to right now because we don't if we don't fully understand the extensive capacity at its you know full-blown scale of ai we don't even understand we're not even gonna know what happens later you know like this donald rumsfeld uh, quote comes to you know the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns we're, we're there you know so we're not trying to catch or stop, you know, we're just trying to regulate, to say how, what is okay, what is not okay. Just, just setting those lines, you know? 
And then we can maximize it. We can use it for our benefit. We can use it to, to make humanity better, to, to, for example, come up with uh, solutions for climate change, you know, or uh, agriculture. There are so many applications that it could be, that it could be better, you know, even coming up with medicine, patents, and so on and so forth. But um, everything has a double side. Even, for example, a patent, you know, it can go, like in biology, you know, if it comes up with a medicine, it can also come up with a pathogen. So everything is uh, is the yin-yang situation. So that's why, that's why we have the limits. If I may add, I think there's an interesting trend, because it, indeed, law is post uh, but we have a trend which is called anticipatory governance, that, you know, we, we have, for instance, with quantum or neurosciences or biotechnology, that, you know, the, the, the maturity of these technologies is not yet there, but we try to really anticipate the impacts on society and try to guide these technologies very early on in the right direction. So I think we, as diplomats, also have to engage in anticipatory diplomat diplomacy, you know, and as, as also a sort of one element in this, in this, in this ecosystem. And lawyers have also been more anticipatory in this sense. Um, so, but I'll stop here. Um, let's do a final round of discussion because we are already approaching actually the end. It should wrap up. It's already five o'clock. But let's have a final round of the please short questions, not five <laughs> minutes presentations. We want. <laughs> Any more questions, maybe from people who have never? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah, I would like to um, ask you a question coming back to human rights and governance. Uh, do you think there is a need for a um, digital uh, human rights declaration? Because human rights are global, human rights are universal. And do we need that in the digital field as well? We need so many things. <laughs> so um, yes, everything would add on. Everything it would be beneficial. Everything would be necessary, even. Um, so you know, I can't remember. You you you're from the Ministry of Finance. Finance. Okay. Well, um, every single effort counts. You know. So if you can put on. Uh, you know, support towards that, that's fantastic. But um, um, yeah, my question was, is there a discussion and on uh, in the United um, States? No. Oh. Uh, my question was, what do you think uh, um, about a universal human uh, rights declaration? It's not a matter of finance or justice or uh, more of justice, but it's a global question. Um, and especially in regard of the discussions that we had, it would be interesting if you think that there is a need for a universal um, supplementary layer, because there are lots of projects, guidelines, reports, and lots of different discussions in different fields. And do you think that there is a need um, uh, for declarations such as uh, the Declaration of Human Rights for the future? So it's a future question. And yes, as I said, I think we need many, many things. Um, the problem is, uh, obviously, again, consensus and everything. But if it was up to me, you know, we would redefine everything. Like all of these instruments, if you, I mean, of course, the, the core principles are still applicable everywhere. But... I mean, they're very obsolete, if you ask me, you know? So, of course, we would need that. Um, so that's why I was asking your ministry, just like your foreign ministry, you, know, you can put it forward and, you know, but, um, but yeah. If I may, uh, um, oh, <laughs> Thank you. If I may just add, um, we from the Austrian foreign ministry have a bit difficulty with this idea of digital rights. Why? Because we think human rights is a different purpose and do cover also uh, the cyber or online domain. We you know, consistently said that we were in human rights that are applicable online and offline. Creating something new would 
you know, have if you're in danger of eroding the, the existing standards. So um, I, 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 you know, hesitant to have such a thing. And then we do have, you know, the discussion in Austria is leading that with the Human Rights Council because we, you know, we are the pen holder of a resolution which gives about human rights. Um, uh, human rights and new technologies, where we discuss how these old fashioned human rights are still applicable to new technologies, not only to the digital realm, but you know, technologies such as quantum te uh, uh, biotechnology and so forth. I think, we have, as you said, we have to be a bit more technology agnostic. We have to discuss generally, you know, human and technology uh, interaction. What kind of society we want to build. Because these technologies, after all, are the tools. They should help us, but they should not sort of totally um, uh, undermine what is basically what makes us human, right? Um, and I would even go a bit beyond. Um, we have to have to find a new way of coming to terms with, with the planet, with life on Earth, with uh, and maybe, uh, you know, change a bit the way we, we, we look at these things in general. But I think it's a deeply human discussion about it. It's not so much the technologies, you know. As, as a diplomat, I'm saying, I'm not so interested in the technology. I'm interested in what it will mean for us, you know, what kind of uh, implication it has. And we, you know, in the United Nations, we talk about the ultimate aim is sustainable development, which covers basically everything under the sun, like, you know, quality of life for individuals, but also society and community. But shall we maybe have another question? No, I think we are online. Oh, Jimena, would you like to have do us the honor of closing words, final words, and then we we'll wrap up? Well, um, thank you very much for for all of your interest and all of your great great questions. Um, as Claudia said, and as I said at the beginning. Uh, this is a matter of us wondering and talking about and questioning what is the world we want to live in and how do we want to interact with this technology, what decisions we want to delegate to this to the systems. And because that's going to transform our lives, as I said, this is a moment in time that is unparalleled to anything that we have seen in, I don't know, something like the past 500 years. And I'm not exaggerating. So uh, it, is, it, is, it is time we really think about it that way. And um, think of, indeed, as Claudia said, what makes us human and differentiate that very much. We need to preserve our, our not only our human dignity towards each other, um, but you know, our critical functions as a human and not, and not become obsolete you know, in what everything that, uh, that 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 we are normally necessary for. So it's not a machine versus human war, you know, it's just keeping it as as it is, you know, not giving it more than it should have, in my opinion. But again, this is a societal conversation that we all need to participate in. And that's why everyone should be just uh, participating. It's not we, we cannot just let it happen, let things happen, because that's how we ended up here with so many other topics. Um, this is a point in time where we all need to pull together and build on this consensus and, uh, you know, just kind of press our leaders to do the right thing. So I just encourage you all to do that and to read our interim report and stay tuned for the final report and uh, to do whatever is in your realm to integrate yourselves in the conversation. And uh, yeah, I'm just available again, you know, if, if you want to contact me or the body or whoever, we're, we're, we're reachable. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think now it's time to wrap up. Very, very great thanks to Jimena, who had fun time for, for this extremely interesting debate. Thank you for participating with your extremely well thought questions. And again, I'm totally with you. These talks aim at providing a, a space for this inclusive, you know, multi-stakeholder discussions that we need. Because in the end, it's not diplomats who will decide, it's not the tech people who will not decide, it's all of us who should decide and will decide. Thank you very much, and hopefully you're joining us again. 
We keep doing these tech diplomacy talks of different issues. Um, and you will be invited again. We'll be happy to host you. <laughs>